Greetings one and all. Welcome to Jerry's Live. As always, I'm your host, Amy Gardner-Dean. Today we are going to be doing episode JL117, that's JL117, Color Pencil How To, and we're dealing with tricky subjects. And today's tricky subject is hair or fur. We're going to kind of use that synonymously. We're doing a little poodle, which is essentially hair and fur, kind of. So. Um, if you are playing along at home and you want to see any of the products that we're going to be showing today on the show, you're going to go to the search box on our website, www.jerrysartorama.com. You're going to type in just the keyword JL117, like the show number. Hit enter. That's going to bring up the list of the products that we're using today so you'll be able to see exactly what we had here and we're working with. So uh, today we're using the Cezanne set of colored pencils and um, it's come to my attention in case anybody sees them, likes them, wants to give them a try. It is a set of 72 pencils and it's normally, I, I can't, I don't know what the normal price is. I know the sale price right now is $24.99 and it includes free shipping. So that means if you're in the continental US, you put the Cezanne pencil set in your cart and you've got some other things. Maybe you're an oil painter, maybe you need some canvas. You put that stuff in there, this ships free. Even if you decide you just want the pencils, that ships free. Trick is you have to be in the continental US and you cannot be ordering anything like that's freight, like a giant easel or furniture. So, um, so the checkout would actually give you all that information, but putting that in your cart triggers that free shipping. So it's a way to actually try something without having to pay additional shipping costs and things like that. So just wanted to let people know while it was on the top of my head, because once I start working, I kind of zone out and only work on that stuff. So, um, so we're going to jump right in. I've got a piece of paper out already that's uh, from the Canson. My teens says pastel paper, but it's, it's, great for colored pencil too. A lot of colored pencil artists use it. That's exclusively what I use when I do colored pencil because I really like the texture. It allows for a lot more layering, I feel, of colored pencil, which I put a lot of layers on, so that's a handy thing for me to have. Um, we've got the Cezanne set. I've got it laid out here uh, around the artwork. We've got uh, a stick eraser. That's always really handy, an eraser shield. So not only can you refine the area you're erasing very easily with that stick eraser, you can actually block out any other area if it's just a small little portion that you need. So that's a handy tool that's very inexpensive. I think they're like $2 and a quarter or something like that. Um, I do have a colorless blender. Uh, these are very helpful. Prismacolor makes them. It's just clear the clear medium that color pencils have. So it allows you to blend multiple colors that you've layered without having to use white like you used to have to do in the old days before the colorless blenders. Um, also on that list are the Finesse colored pencil blender pens. It's a little teeny tiny bit of solvent in a pen. It's got a, a, just a regular barrel, small barrel tip and a fine point brush that you can then kind of put on its side and do larger areas. It has almost no odor. That's the first time I think I've noticed it. And I think it's more because we're humid in here as opposed to where I was working on this um, in my studio. But it helps kind of blend wax pens to get uh, wax pencils together. So if you want to kind of blend them a lot smoother than even that colorless blender stick can allow and even make dark colors really dark, this is a fantastic little tool, especially for the brush tip around like eyes and little tiny bits of hair works really well. Um, any pencil sharpener obviously will work with colored pencils. I have a little extender on standby. I don't think it's on the list, but I just don't like pencils getting too short. So I've got one at the ready um, and I think we're ready to go. So I've got a bridge. I may use it. I may not use it just because I, I don't want to get blocked areas out where, um, where we're working. Although it seems like they didn't have problems with the last time, didn't it? Yeah, it was fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then we've talked before on our other colored pencil episodes about color charts. I usually do one that's on white paper and then one that's on dark paper for home, for my home studio. I actually do them on this kind of neutral color that we're using because I like to use it a lot because it's just a kind of a nice warm 
natural color that provides kind of a warmth to a subject, even if it's in the background behind all the colors. So uh, that would be something if you have specific colors you want to use, just do a little mini color chart on them. It doesn't take that long. Then you see how that performs, because uh, it performs very differently. Colors mm -hmm. become really bright. Light colors become really bright on dark. Dark colors kind of fade away. Then you've got the, the opposite with the white. So always good to have. It, it seems like it takes a little while, but it's a very helpful tool and it will actually save you time while you're working. Take your frustration. Too. Yes, it will. All right, so the subject matter we're using just ended up happening to be because I'm, I've been working on a commission with this dog. Now I've got one that's further along that's the commission. So <laughs> this is done for multiple pictures and this is something we can kind of talk about while I'm working and why I made the choices I did. The picture we're using is actually just straight from the actual picture itself. This is, as a lot of commissions that I do, a picture of a late pet. So they don't always have all the pictures that you want where it's like the perfect pose or the perfect color or, or you know, the perfect expression, which that was what this one was about. The dog had a little smile and she wanted that little smile, but it had a favorite toy. So the toy had to be down in front. Well, I'm doing the one with the toy in the mouth because it's just easier <laughs> than extrapolating from multiple photos. So, um, so let's grab the picture that we've got. Now it's good if you're doing commissions to have multiple pictures and have people mark, you know, if it's a specific um, one shot shows color well, because you can see with this, when she um, puts the overhead on, this, is very washed out. There's a lot of flash in this picture. You can see from the eyes, the reflection especially. So that's something where it's good to have someone give you other pictures like this, this little dog. You can see kind of the apricot colors in it, which is why I picked the color. You can see the facial expression a little better. This is the one that she liked the face on, but it's super, super pixelated because it's not high resolution. So, uh, so those are good to have all those extra to be able to work from. All right, now hair is a tricky subject and people want to tend to just take a color, like say, cause this is a, you know, light colored poodle, take their white and actually just do hair by hair by hair. This is not where you want to do that. Generalization is the key to doing hair, whether it's an animal, whether it's in portraits, you don't want to see every hair that's on the head or the body. So what I urge you to do and what how I started this with, with the other one, and I've kind of done this in quadrants, so you can, kind of getting further along in each of the quadrants. You can see that I've done a very light sketch. I'm not even, yeah, you can see that. It's showed up, up well enough. Um, a very light sketch here. Notice there's not little hair and edges and all that. There's not even the shadows. I just wanted to know where to put that body while I was working. Then in this one, I've actually gone and using the dark, almost carved in where I want that line to be of the hair. This almost looks like, what were those things called when you were a kid and you sat and got the profile done? It was a portrait and it, they cut it out and it was just oh, like, like black and white. Oh, I have those. What is it called? Um, I can't remember. Remember, it was a certain name. A you said, it's yeah, a it's a silhouette, but it's a specific, it's a specific name. They used to do them at the mall and you sit. Yes. So anyway, that's, that's using this as that same kind of guide. With this outline of the dark and the light, it's actually going to be kind of those first informational bits that you're giving the viewer as to that this is hair. Okay, that's how they start to read the texture. That can give people as much information to extrapolate is this a smooth coat? Is this a curly coat? Starts giving people just just this basic information in this box here. Of course, the, the picture is covering it. Just this information in this box here <laughs> with the outline. You can start kind of getting information that's going to help you decide how to view this subject, okay? Whether this w would be if we had Katie up here and we were doing a portrait of Katie with her really long hair or with it up in the bun like she's got it now and kind of the little pieces of bangs, this silhouette is what gives you that information for how to read it. So if I'm working on that, you want a very sharp pencil point. And just fire along with questions while we they come up, girls, because this is going to be 
we're gonna kind of fly by the seat of our pants. You don't have to make this exactly like this. You don't have to take, you know, pains to make this look just like a photographic duplicate, but you do want to give enough information and some of the little kind of divots and turns where it's not generalized so much that it could be anything. Use it as informational shapes. Okay, with a poodle, it's it's not tufted like something like a cocker or like a, um, you know, slick like a short-haired dog. It's got kind of curls that go every which way. So you're going to want to show those coming out. I am looking at the picture, but I'm also kind of making some decisions for how I want to do this. Because if you make it look too much like this picture, it could make it so that it's a lot more difficult once you start in with that light to fill it in. Now, with this picture and kind of the background, I've done one very light coat, like you can see here, that I'm doing as I come down to find that form, and then I went back over it again one more time. Now, with colored pencils, with any type of rendering you do, any type of subject matter, when you're doing any of this drawing part like this, you want this pencil to stay super sharp. Now, I urge you, especially as you're doing your color chart, pencils will wear at a certain speed, right? And each brand is a little bit different because it's just the formulation is different, the waxes may be different, all that. You're going to want to learn to test that pencil kind of on its side so that when you've got, you know, it starts wearing flat, you can use that edge where it's sharper. You want to test them where you just put it down and you kind of mash it until it's flat and you use that for coloring larger surface areas. Get used to doing that with your pencils and different types of paper because pencils perform very differently on different types of paper. This would obviously be very different than like the, um, than the Legion, which is super, super uh, soft. It's got a little bit of tooth, but that's very flat, very soft. So that goes on very differently. So it's going to wear differently on that paper without that same texture. So that is as important as drawing skills almost in my opinion, because if you don't know how to kind of use your tool properly, it's going to be a lot more time of a learning curve. Okay. So see, we're kind of getting the shape in here people see where we're going with this now the background parts are parts that you don't want to go super fast and rush because number one pushing too hard or really scratching at it without slowly kind of working that softened edge down more can actually start denting your paper it can leave marks that as you try to work smoothly it's not going to cover it properly you're going to get kind of almost like what looks like little visual slug trails if that makes any sense it's what it looks like and, and you can see it when you've dent, dented the paper and damaged it if you've got it at a little bit of an angle there will be this one part that doesn't have the little bit of wax bloom to it and you're like what is that little area that's matte that's not reflecting back and you can see the line right from what, like pushing down too hard? Fr it's from like pushing down too hard. Basically? Or even or even just um, let's say you you know you've got your paper tape down like this, you are putting other supplies on it or whatever, picking it up can, you know, with the back of your pencil can leave a little dent, a little divot. Just like treat it like a canvas. Just because it's paper doesn't mean that it's still not soft and fragile. And you want that paper to perform evenly everywhere, right? So make sure that you are good about Not treating it. Like, see, I've got this over this, so I can put my hand on it. I can use the leaning bridge as well. Oh, yeah, I've done that well. before with um, my watch. Yes. I scraped it across. Mm -hmm. it. Watches, rings, bracelets. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's another story. That leaves marks that you just have to throw the paper away. <laughs> Okay, so see how that's, this is just like what a first coat would be. And I can feel that this edge is, uh, notice I'm not holding this up like this. I'm not choking up on it like this like I would be for detail. I've got my hand back actually, and I'm helping to kind of use it to make a kind of a, 
counterbalance pressure, I guess, would be the best way to say that. Just to try to get an even fill. I can go back in, you can see in some spots where I've gone a little faster, there's a little thicker area. You can kind of go back in and even that out, but really the second or third coat, if you want to go darker, is fine for kind of fixing that up. So right now I've got an edge because I've pushed down on that. I'm just gonna go down this one leg. Hey, Amy. Yes. Um, when you do colored pencil work, yes. Do you have a general rule for how many layers you don't want to exceed? Or... It depends on the brand of pencil. It mm -hmm. depends on the paper, as far as to how many layers you can safely go. Something like that paper I just showed that was much softer and that didn't have a lot of tooth, you may not be able to get as many layers in a wax pencil. Potentially, an oil pencil, you might be able to get a little bit more. Then you can also use the solvents and stuff like that, get that to kind of soften and blend in. That may give more tooth kind of area that frees up from the debris that the pencil leaves, right? Because really what this is, what this is, just like, just like a graphite or a charcoal pencil, it's rubbing the color off, right? It's, it's debris, essentially, that you are purposefully kind of scratching onto the surface. So if you soften that and let it kind of make it almost more into a paint with that solvent pen, it's gonna go down in and give you a little bit more tooth suddenly. The, that's, the solvent's not going to fill it and make it so that there's not that fiber to grab on. Holly has asked if you ever use the back side of the paper um, or if you have a preference as to which side of the paper to use. Different papers, like, like the My Teens, has more texture on the front surface. On the back, it's much softer. I don't like the back because you can't put as many layers on it. It depends on what the paper is. Every paper is different, just like some watercolor papers. They may be, you know, there used to be that, that old belief that with what the arches that you could only um, paint on the front. So look at the watermark, look at the watermark. What's well, all sized the same, right? So it's really, that doesn't apply nowadays, but it's, it just depends on what paper you're actually working on. That's why it's good to, to make little scraps from a piece of paper. If there's a pad or something that you've gotten, do some experimenting with some different mediums. Maybe take that first sheet, and yes, I know it's, it feels wasteful to use a whole sheet, but take that and try the different mediums on it that you're going to actually be working with. So you can test it and see how, you know, how well does it absorb if it's something where it's like watercolor or watercolor pencils. How many layers of colored pencils can you get on it? Go down, when, when we test mixed media paper, um, like we're talking about doing a mixed media journal now. When we test mixed media paper, I'm gonna move this up so you can see. I'll start with, I'll take a whole bunch of colored pencils and I'll usually take seven or eight just to see. So I'll do the first color like this and I'll go the whole way down with that, right? Maybe down to here. So that'll all be there. And you can tell this is, this is just regular printer paper because there's no tooth. This is about all I'm gonna be able to put on it. Then I'll take another color, start there, and go down. Then I'll take another color, start there, go down. Then I'll take another color. So each time it is getting a whole layer put on it. So I can see when I get down to maybe seven or eight and I put the number next to them so I know how much of that just, just went on there. Sometimes you could keep going. Sometimes depending on how that, that particular pencil grabs the paper, you can go on and on and on. Sometimes at three and four, it is so gunked up, there's no way to add more. The next layer looks really messy, and then all of a sudden the next layer grabs back on again. For this particular paper, the Canton Me Taunt, do you prefer the front or the back? Do you have a preference? Uh, yeah, I, and you probably couldn't hear because of the headphones. The The front is definitely, it's it's got more layers. I want as many layers as possible for, for blending and layering colors. So I always want the front of it that paper. More tooth to it, the front of more tooth to it? Way more tooth. It's, it's got, you can see kind of in this, it's it's almost like little tiny egg crates, mm -hmm. okay? And the more fill you get, like if I yeah. went back over this, and I and, and it comes at an angle, right? Almost, um, where it comes at kind of a linear angle, the tooth to me. So if I, I can play with that and I can do it where it's more vertical kind of to that angle and fill it and go really slow with a sharper pencil, 
and suddenly that's filled in a lot of that open texture, right? Then I can go back with another color and go the next way. But the more I fill that like that, the more than those layers may not want to accept it as I go when I do a really thorough fill, if that makes sense, Katie. Yeah. While you're talking about that, can yes. you also do a brief explanation of wax bloom? Wax bloom is, is something that you'll notice more in like the student grade pencils. As you get up more with some of the more professional ones that are wax, you will still sometimes get it. Wax is even a candle, right? You take a candle and you turn it on its side and you draw with it and it leaves just kind of that whitish looking residue. Mm -hmm. Okay, so wax bloom is just when you've gone over it enough and enough and enough, the layers of wax are building, it starts making it so that at an angle where there's shine on the paper, you can actually see, if I just did this and just left the stroke like that, if I stopped and this was maybe the fourth or the fifth to the eighth coat and did this sideways, that light, this would be a little bit reflective from an angle, okay? The more of them that you do, and then if you're trying to light your work to do photography, the more you're gonna notice that. Now, I've heard different things from even different people that are our viewers, that they will take just even a little like soft rag and you can burnish it and take it off. Oil pastels, that's what oil pastels, when you use the really cheap student grade, like the crepa and things like that, that you used in like second and third grade, it's that haze. You can buff that out too. It's just the type of wax that it is that makes it hard enough to bond that pigment together also can be a little bit of a detriment. Now, the Finesse Blender has the solvent in it, so I can take it, it helps break down that wax. So that unless you have like so many ridiculous layers, you won't get that bloom because that's just basically dissolved that wax. Could you also use Gamsol to blend? You can, you can use all sorts of different types of solvents. If it's a, a solvent that can be used for oil painting, you can use it for colored pencil. The problem with that, <laughs> and you can use it for, you know, for other stuff. The problem with that is when you're putting something on a brush, unless you're a very experienced painter, which a lot of colored p pencil people tend to come from drawing, not necessarily painting. Not saying that painters don't do colored pencil, because I do colored pencil, but that brush is absorbing a lot more fluid than you may realize, right? If you're not used to doing watercolor, you want to either work with a really small brush that's not a very thirsty brush and practice first on some bits and pieces so you're not suddenly instantly like working on this and just it's gushing out of like a really big, like a big bellied watercolor brush, okay? So the nice thing about this is even though once the solvent's out, obviously you, ha you throw this away. This is very, very controllable. Very little comes out of that pen, just enough to wet that and to help drag it, right? Even if I put this down, which I tried it on a scrap piece of paper before I used it because I'd never used these solvent pens and I did not want that other piece to be like the coup d'etat of crazy town. Why didn't I test this first? It's not gonna come gushing out and it dries very, very quickly. So that's, you know, you could use even just like little flats or something that were very short or even a bristle brush that's not absorbent at all, you know, that type of thing. It's something you want to test. And again, if you take a soft rag and you buff, that will lift the wax just as easily. All right, so let's go on to, can everybody see this where we've outlined this and suddenly you can kind of make out that hair is that, I, yeah. I can't tell on this, on yeah, this monitor. Okay. On All right. So then we would go to where we're going to start with kind of putting some fur in. I've gone to this one and I've actually taken a light colored, kind of a cream yellow. Because I'm trying to take this color, because in here is going to be lighter, right? trying to take this color and just kind of start building some texture with that pencil. Now, that being said, just because this is a curly coated dog does not mean when you're putting lines down with a colored pencil that you don't still want to follow the way the hair goes. 
okay? Because even the best artist will sometimes leave a little bit of line. It's going to be imperceptible to not noticeable at all if you follow along with the way that the hair is growing. On the back, the hair grows this way, okay? When I'm getting over here and going to the legs, it's coming down at an angle. So I'm going to want to color with that very sharp pencil. No need to focus on the curls and stuff yet. There's no reason to pull that out because that starts giving too much information without that foundation. With colored pencils, you do an underpainting just like you would do a regular painting. It's not a, just a kind of color by number. I mean, you can do, there's some techniques that you can do that with, but with hair and stuff like that, it's way better to go ahead and get that kind of underpainting down and done before going from there. And I don't know how well this is, it's, it's hard to, the first coat didn't show up. It's close enough to that kind of apricot color where you can't see it super easy. So then with that in there, notice I'm going along the lines of the way that hair grows down that tail, right? Then we can start going into finding some whites. Where's this? Okay, this is where you really wanna start looking at this. Don't draw every hair. Look at your drawing. You can see some lighter parts, okay? So generalize in some places, but then make oh, a nice strong stroke. And if anybody saw that marker episode that we did, where we had Jeff on and Jimmy, this is where you can actually go back in with this for your super white whites, like in the corner of the eyes, uh, for your highlight, if you did not get that in early, kind of before you did the eyes, it escaped your mind or whatever, you can go back in and you can put that little pop with that, uh, either just a watercolor gouache or even an acrylic gouache. I would probably opt for a very dry brush watercolor wash because then if something happens and you made a mistake, you can still potentially kind of pull it back up with the acrylic wash that's going to be on there. Can everybody see that that's suddenly quite a bit lighter? You can see a little bit of kind of the hair going. This is hard for me to look up there with the reading glasses on because I'm not catching the. We can see it, yeah. Okay. All right, and then in areas, we'll go over to this next side because we've got kind of his eyes and all that. So you can see how I'm going to kind of pull this out. Now his face looks very flat. You've got the really super high detail of the eyes and the mouth, or eyes and the nose here going on, but not a lot of other information. So what we're gonna do with this to find this fur is we're gonna focus on the lightest lights and the darkest darks around his face. And I like to try to go in maybe around the nose first so it kind of works itself out. This looks way too wide and very flat. And it's only because of you don't have kind of those little bits of information. So when you're doing a portrait like this, in general, how much time would you think you're putting into it start to finish? Uh, the one back here, that's got about, oops, pull it down a little bit. That's got about 20 hours in it so far because of the slow layering. You have to be very patient with colored pencils. Well, it's, it, yes, you have to be incredibly patient. It's not like, um, 
And, and you know what? As an artist, you know your, your limits and you know your patience level. If you like to really slot paint on and you know, you've got it all around your studio and you enjoy just a messy, good, fun time, colored pencils may not be the medium for you <laughs> because yep. this is not, this is very much, even if you're doing abstracts and stuff, you've got to be very good about going back. Did I get enough layers on here Did, you know, where am I going from here? Where do I need to kind of go back and fill maybe more in the paper texture and things like that? That's going to be an issue. Um, I liken it to um, when people are like, I don't understand how you've got the patience for that. Some people are really like, I overthink it, right? I overdo it. I'm like micromanage the whole little thing. Uh, when, we, when I was in kindergarten, we had to color a sheep. It was a math problem. There were seven sheep on a picture. Remember the old, in my day, mimeographed uh, stuff. And you had to color you know, the five sheep green because they wanted to know if you knew how many five was. So I had had art lessons with my grandmother as a kid and she taught me to look at the natural world through kind of, you know, being very critical about it being the looking right and all that. So I colored five sheep natural colors because sheep are not green. And <laughs> Did you get that one wrong? Uh, well, no, she demanded that I color the sheep green, and I said, well, that's, you know, but I, I, I being the four-year-old kindergarten kid that thought reason was going to get me out of it, I, I know what you want to know is if I know how many five <coughs> is, and I do, but, you know, when I do art, I want it to look natural, so, you know, so you can see, though, I know how many five is, and she said, I don't care if you know how many five is, color the sheep green. Well, that was capital punishment back then. I got paddled. <laughs> so I came back out and I sat down and I took a green pen or crayon and I circled the sheep green. That was not color my sheep green. Doorbelling. So that is how you know somebody is going to be a good colored pencil artist because you have the patience and tenacity to at all lengths go that extra mile. Okay, so see how we're kind of pulling those colors out? See how that all of a sudden <coughs> popped that little nose out? Let me find that dark color. There's a little bit of... And with this, I'm barely pressing because I just want to color the paper just enough with that little bit of shadow. And I can come back in with the light. Frida, it sounds like you have a question coming. No Frida, question. question. Okay. I heard the, like there was going to be something. Hmm. Oh my gosh, it's so humid in here that my rain glasses are fogging up. <laughs> I can barely see. Uh. All right. You see how with a little bit of darks, I'm finding those little bits of darks <coughs> and enhancing those. This is the, our ball here. Let's kind of pull that out so it doesn't, makes a little more sense as to why that's not a the little face here. It's neat to see how much just those few little tiny strokes really. It all of a sudden pop, yep. it, it, it makes no sense that that little bit right should off. make that much of a difference. But see how that, and then if you wanted to be even like tricky or cool, pull a little bit of this, I can come back in and work on that. See how that little bit rounded that ball out suddenly? It's little nuances of just pick your highlights, then go back and pick a little bit of dark, then go back and pick a little bit of a mid-tone. It helps you really get that. Now with some of these, with, with a white dog, you obviously can't make just the dog white. We're not putting our hand down and grinding the color into the paper and just making it plain white. So what you're going to need to do, and this is when we've talked about color theory and, and things like that, is start making some decisions. How am I going to put these shadows in here? Do I want to go warm colors? Do I want to go cool colors? Right? Well, we've got this nice warm tone for the background, don't we? So, and then we've got a very neutral brown. So 
what would options be that would help kind of push and pull that? So let's look at this just really quick so you can see. Now this actually is, is the, the dark brown, but I added a very dark blue. And then I added the really blue gray, right? The, the cool gray. What? Never use black. There's a little bit of black in there. <laughs> in the nose? Ah, uh, just the, the, the pupils, the nose, the <laughs> line. Uh, there actually is a little bit in the mouth because it just was not dark enough to really get that kind of hollow of the mouth looking, you know, deep enough. But see how that's m multiple layers. It's funny, I can see the paper and it's kind of doing this a little bit. The multiple layers, you can't see that there's any blue in there, but I've made a black with just those colors, with kind of a, the burnt umber looking color, the like probably a Prussian blue and a very kind of steel blue, really dark, dark gray. Right, and then I've used some kind of raw siennas coming out and a little bit of kind of a reddish brown because I like the warm colors coming at you. Cool colors should stay in the shadows. They should fall away. So that's what kind of using these little bits, there's a little bit of kind of a very deep reddish brown in there. There's a little bit of kind of um, a, another gray that's a very warm gray. And then I'm using French gray, which is kind of, I guess kind of a reddish, really light brownish reddish gray. Yeah. What I, I think is a French gray in some of these other areas as the shadows, as I've kind of built that up. Now see, this is, because this background is so much blacker, that white shows up so much brighter mm -hmm. just with that difference of that background being super, super black. Mary Monson would like to know how a light gray paper would have worked for this project. A light gray paper would have made it very cold. And light gray is not gonna show those whites very well. So it's going to push it. Let me see if we've got gray in this. We don't have you know, browns. Yeah, if you, if you know where like a, a really light gray is. I think we have another black and gray and white pattern here. Okay, now it's worth checking. Hold on, Mary. Hold that thought. But I think part of the consideration on this one, at least, is probably the, the coloring of the dog itself, because in a lot of, um, on the back, for example, it almost looks like a very, very, very faint peach colored yes. coat. Um, yes, it was a, a tear stains around the eyes and that sort of thing. Those are all warm colors, right? Which would be part of why you chose. Well, and you can you can paper. see in this picture is too dark. Maybe you can see it. It's obviously an apricot poodle, just that that's the white's gotten really sun bleached on it, you know, yeah. from them cutting down to that puppy coat because the the apricots usually at the higher end. It's not it doesn't always go all the way down and who knows if it's a, a purebred poodle or not. But that's you can really see kind of those warmer areas there in that little guy. So yeah, so so using a cool color, unless it's a really warm gray, is probably not going to be the best bet for the paper. I, you know, I've done so many different colored pencil works through the years, and I always let whatever it is that the subject matter is dictate what the actual color is of the paper that I'm going to use, because you can use so much less colored pencils if you find a nice neutral color that kind of... A neutral paper? Well, just there's a color that kind of plays well nicely with it, right? Just so then you don't, you've got a nice mid value. Like when we've done the, we did the charcoal work where we had a gray value paper and then we did the white and the black. That took a lot of the mid tone where you didn't have to go back in and, you know, blend it. So you're, you're kind of using a paper as almost kind of a, a color mid tone, if that makes any sense. No luck. Yeah, except for you. It's for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, since I'm after our warm gray, so I'm trying to yeah, yeah. keep a little cooler gray, but yeah. and their pastel paper is just a little different, but right. you get the effect. Now, all these lines I'm putting down right now 
are very faint, I'm trying first to kind of carve that image out that I want. Then I go back in and I really darken those colors. Get my lightest lights in first and darkest dark. So when Mary was asking, light gray. So there's a light gray, but see how that would be way too light for the poodle, right? Unless you just really want to have kind of only an outline and a little bit. There, this actually wouldn't be the worst color choice. I'm going to put it kind of right next to him. See how that kind of fits nicely with some of those shadows, right? That wouldn't be the worst. And it's it's a warm gray, so it kind of matches up with that little bit of the apricot color. This one would be, although it would fit those shadows, would probably be a little bit too cool, in my opinion. I don't think I would like that because I think the warm tones on it would, would stand out really wrong. This I would like. I like the felted ones for some reason. They're pretty, yeah. It, it's, it's just, it gives a really interesting look to the, to the work. And that's dark enough where the white would really pop on it. I don't want to draw on it and since we've got, I mean, I guess I could draw on the back. I am not right-handed. So see, the white shows up pretty decent on that. So that wouldn't be the worst. Have you ever used sanded paper to use colored pencils? And what was your thought? Sanded paper works. I've used it. It doubles to me the amount of pigment that comes off your pencil. So you're wearing your pencils at like double the rate, which to me, the price of replacing pencils is highway robbery. <laughs> it's just, I'm just a really cheap person by nature and replacing colored pencils is is torture to me. So I, I've used it before. I think if I was going to use it, I would use a much finer number rather than kind of, it's like sandpaper, right? So an 800 is gonna be the least textured and then a 100 is gonna be like super crazy. So I would use the finest if I was going to use the sandpaper. But the thing is, most of the sandpapers are colored just sand color, so you're not only using way too much pencil, but you're also having to add more anyway than you would if you used kind of a paper that complemented your work. They're also frustrating to me because, it, like you said, it grinds down the paper, so you have to breathe it. To yes, like kind of float oh, around. And lots I've of it. Always, always, without fail, somehow drag my hand through it and get stuff where I don't want to. Yes. One of our YouTube viewers does wildlife on suede mat boards. Do you have any recommendations? Ooh. I have never tried suede with colored pencils. That would be something you would need to test because it, it may be too soft for the colored pencils to really grab on. Right. Um, I mean that it works great with pastels. I just don't. I don't know if colored pencils are soft enough for it to really come off. Without having to like really. Yeah. Working well, and, and it still may not, yeah. depending on the, you know, because it's it's very velvety, you know. It, it, you can't add, like we were talking about the sanded paper with pastels, you can't add that much pastel to those, uh, that type of paper. So this isn't powdery. This right. is, you know, so it would be, if that even comes off at all, would be the concern. And then how much are you having to mash it down to really get it to come off easily if you can get it off? So... My my instinct would be no, but that would sure be fun to test. It would be fun to test. <laughs> um, can you just explain aloud that if you were doing this not as a demonstration, you would not have drawn the quadrant lines as dark as you did? Uh, yes. Okay. These were on here like this because initially what I was going to do was have this at different. Each of these quadrants would be at a different level of completedness, right? And then it just, with other stuff that came up with all the other things that I do, this did not get that far. I got some of it further along, like in here, it's got some shadows and stuff that we can talk about in a minute. But this is, this, you would never do that, you, because this is. Because you would not be able to effectively erase it. Even on your best, dra yes, this is not, I don't ever draw with grids. I, and it's, and it's not that, it's not that they're not a great tool. Like, see, that's as, as good as it's getting there. I, 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 doing that makes it so that I can't draw it because I've just never drawn with grids. So 
this was only this was for mere demonstration purposes only yeah. and so as I did the drawing I could do this right to have a place where it would still kind of reasonably be in the camera if I folded down the white edges and see it so yeah sorry I guess I should have um, explained that I've been explaining it but then I just wanted you to oh you're just like I my fingers are tired yeah sorry guys that was I that was a that's something I should have said right away. See, there we go. This is why I did this. So see, look, ta-da, doggy fits in the, in the quadrants. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Can they see how this is coming out? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, so as we're going up here, with some of this, where I know I want it to be lighter, I'm just gonna go ahead and very carefully with the sharp pencil, press just very gently to just, see how you can see that it's lighter, but it's not as hard as these other areas where I've really been pushing. You're just gonna very lightly, because I don't want all this to be, I'll go back in and kind of sharpen it up. I just want it to be lighter than that kind of apricot color that I've got under there. So I'm still, as I apply it and pushing very gently, I'm still applying it with the way that that hair moves, right? So that if for some reason I apply it and it's a little too thick, it just reads as hair because I've got it. Going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Okay. See how that kind of, that little bit of lightness help start to kind of dome. This picture's very, they used a lot of flash in it, so it's very hard to see, but. And here's where I'm gonna add just a couple little kind of corkscrewy, where the hair goes a little bit of a different way because it gives that illusion of that poodly And the thing is she cut this, this dog's always was in it like a puppy cut for the head, which seems strange that it wouldn't be kind of the same as the body, much shorter. We went, had a lot of discussions on that before I started the work with, she's like, well, I like this, but I want it shorter. How short? Well, I don't know, just like a puppy cut. Well, I don't need, without a picture of your dog with that short of hair you know hard for me to know and hard for me to know exactly what your dog's structure looked like with it so we actually did some test drawings and she approved them for yes this is what i wanted because there were not enough pictures see how just that little bit starts popping those ears out now i would take I take this kind of dove gray color. That's very sharp. This is a very warm gray. So since this isn't so much true shadow, I'm wanting to use it just to differentiate it. Cause see how this is really, there's limited shadows because of how much overkill that flash was. I just want some areas that are gonna have a little bit harder line so that these little fluffies really stand out nice. And even though you can't see that up here, for people to read this as an ear, I'm putting a little bit of a line because some it, you're making the suggestions that are helping people to, to view this, right? So you don't want it to just look like a big weird cutout, like, you know how if, if you got a black cat and you take a picture of it, you see eyes, Just right? I have a black cat yes. and I don't have a single good picture of her. No, so, so with, with the white dog or a black animal, sometimes you have to extrapolate the in-between values, right? To really get that to, to work right. Hey, what sharpener are you using? It's not on the list. Uh, I, I didn't put one specifically on the list, and I don't know if we've... I usually have the, um, the two-piece Coombe magnesium sharpener. 
and I think that I left it in my office and this was over here. It's a brass, uh, what is it, the Mobius and Rupert. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's an easy size for, for uh, this kind of roundness of, of pencil. It's just slightly narrower barrel wise than some of the other brands, which to me is easier to hold on to, but when you're sharpening it is a little less easy. So I like that sharpener. You prefer the manual sharpeners over the? Uh, I would never. Eat too much. Like okay, the... there's, I've only used one electric sharpener that did not eat too much of the pencil because a lot of them don't signal you, even if it stops, it has an auto stop. A lot of them don't signal you right away and sometimes you have to be, like, pull them up right at the end to keep the point sharp where it doesn't kind of bust the end of the tip off. Mm -hmm. The only sharpener that I, and it's not that I don't think that other ones don't exist out there because one viewer was like, they exist. Well, you know, I agree they exist. We just don't carry them because they're crazy. Expensive. Yes. Yeah. Very or expensive. maybe you just got one from, uh, you know, a less expensive brand that, lucky you, is a very gentle sharpener but most of them don't and it's so much easier to be looking right at it and control because every little bit of pigment you lose off this it's not like you can sharpen this and keep the pigment right. like like, like some no so so every little bit of pigment you lose is that much sooner that you're gonna have to you know start deciding what you're gonna do for a replacement so that's it's just easier to use the hand sharpener I do. I did have one that was electric that worked exceptionally well. They don't make it anymore, Not and really. I burned out the motor because well. I did. Well, I did uh, like a series of like 10, 16 by 20 colored pencil mm -hmm. sharpener. You know that that I was like that I like the really dark backgrounds because you know me. It's much more dramatic, and then it just burned the mess out of them, and that was it. I wanted to give it a burial in the backyard because it was so sad. All right, are there any other questions? Because I think we're getting near kind of the, the end of this. Seven minutes. Okay. We'll get the questions in. I'm going to go in here with the Prismacolor. There's something, about, there's so much wax here, which I don't like. But it, it gives just a little harder line white until you go to that gouache. It's just way crumblier is the only problem. So you have to have to use it at an angle because I'm apparently much rougher with and, and, and it's not that these are crumbly by any means. It's that I used to work with oil pencils and they've got a different texture and consistency and you can push a lot harder. You actually have to push a lot harder in my opinion to get them on the paper. And they don't that wax doesn't uh, crumble as easy. All right, well, I'm just gonna keep going. So fire questions away. Um, is there an area that anybody's got any questions about? Sherry wants to know if they'll color the shadow under the left ear. Under this ear, I'm guessing? His left ear. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. She just wants to see what I'm going to do with that? Yeah. Okay. So let's see if we've got is this blue or. Okay, that's. Now, with this, because I've already got a layer of wax down out here, I'm sharpening this really hard. Nice, super hard point and an angle. Oh, wait. She said other left. I guess the ear that's like going into the background. This one? Oh, I wouldn't put this in because this was a reflection of a super bright flash, yeah. right? So this is, this little shadow here is just the super, like see how there's no shadow under the feet. That's just not, that looks like a dog floating in space. So when I did this, I brought it down to here with this. See how that gives the dog a grounding? It still makes the light more believable on the leg and stuff, but you're not getting that super overdone light in the background. Was that the one she meant, or was she joking saying the other left? Mm -mm. Okay, yeah, sorry. I thought she meant right here. Um, also, this is a good question. Do colored pencils in general have a shelf life? 
No. It, uh, okay. <laughs> Properly cared for. Yeah. And stored. And stored. Your colored pencils should not have a shelf life. I've had people ask me questions like this, and they're like, well, but mine are kind of, they smell weird and blah, blah, blah. They were keeping them in the back window of their car. Yeah. So then, yes, they probably have a shelf life, and you may have some problems, you know, with even application and stuff. Properly stored in a climate-controlled area where they're not, you know, dealing with, I mean, I don't think freeze-thaw would hurt them, but heat definitely will not be great yeah. to them but heat you don't want heat on any of your well, and it's, art projects you don't want to bake things well heat and wax are not friends right what the art of encaustic says that the, that the, yeah. that the law of temperature melts things i mean granted there's a lot less wax and, and you know more pigment in these <clears throat> but it, it's still if you think about it as you know being like a solution it makes yes. the pigment in the wax binder if you're heating up the thing that's holding the lead together yes inside, it's not gonna right and it's not as soft obviously as like candle wax but it's it's still very easy to heat so would you use a fixative on this when you're done no you're gonna frame this under glass right because what's a fixative a fixative is a solvent based spray what does solvent do to color pencils that we just saw with with coloring this in that they're completely different color now y y even if you're very light-handed it can affect that like i told the story about even though you can do it i told the story about using just regular the regular krylon yeah. fixative with that zebra that was an oil pencil and it like because it was super light layers it just evaporated the back of the leg. Now, it ended up working out well because it looked like dust, like it was in dust, right? Mm -hmm. So I just enhanced that to not lose a whole bunch of time on having to go back and repair it. But you're, you want to put this, this is not like an acrylic or an oil where it's got a much more durable film to it. This doesn't have a film at all. This is just little pigment particles that are clinging to a paper or substrate, right? So you definitely want to have this, you know, matted or, uh, you know, with spacers behind glass to help with the light fastness, because that's the other thing. Like pastels, because there's minimum binder in these, not all colors are light fast. Even the, even the, like the Caran Dash that claim that their, their pencils are the most light fast, not all of them are still light fast, right? So you want to give yourself as much wiggle room as you can to protect your artwork with any medium. But that's a very good question, because how do you know if you don't ask? Okay, see how that little bit of shadow now is popping that ear out? And take care. Now I wish I hadn't put the line on it.